We're going to be in Romans chapter 2. We're going to be in Romans chapter 2 tonight. So while you're turning there, um, Lord's never done this before, but he laid a song on my heart to sing before I preach tonight. So as you're turning there, Miss Joy, if you just want to lead me in, we're going to sing. First time I heard this song was in uh, Silverdale Penitentiary, and I hope it's a blessing to you. The drunk on the street, the rich in the palaces, the poor and unlearned, and the men of degree, they all have a soul in need of salvation, and they all have to come by Calvary. And I am so glad God saves old sinners. I'm real. them free but the biggest surprise in redeeming old sinners is that he would save an old sinner like me oh was I so bad that I needed forgiveness and was I so wrong that I had to be redeemed? I wasn't a thief, but I lived in sin's prison, and I was as lost as a sinner could be. Amen. Miss Joy, just hang on to that for the invitation. Brother Harold has to go to prison himself tonight. So uh, we'll sing that for the invitation as well. Um, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Uh, the last, last month when I got the opportunity to preach, we preached out of Romans 1. We talked about uh, not being ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, monthly now, I just figured we'd go right through the book of Romans and uh, let this teach me and let me pour my heart out to you. Romans chapter 2 tonight. Stand when you found it. Um, we're going to read <coughs> uh, just a couple of verses by way of introduction. Um, chapter number 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Tonight we're going to preach for just a few moments on this thought, the judgment of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. God, thank you so much for our message this morning, God, that dealt with that Ananias and Sapphira and how your judgment was poured out upon him. God, I pray tonight is how we dive into Romans chapter 2, God, that you get me out of your way, that you make this text come alive to this thy people, help them to understand the judgment of God so that we may live therein. God, I pray and I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. So last week, or last month rather, uh, we, we talked about you know, Paul writing to that church there in Rome, those scattered believers, and we talked about how those believers were made up of all different backgrounds, being in Rome, being in the capital of the city. You would have had a large uh, group of Gentile believers, primarily Gentile believers, but we do know there were Jews there, part of that church as well, people that had a head knowledge of the law and the books of Moses and we know he, he started out Romans in chapter 1 by making sure they understood the main thing was the main thing, and that was the gospel of Jesus Christ, and how we ought to be unashamed of his death, burial, and resurrection in our daily lives, and how we live, and how we operate. Then he spent the latter part of chapter number 1 dealing with uh, man's uh, total rebellion and man's sin, and he talked about the wrath of God, and how he could turn them over to a reprobate mind, and you could probably see as the, the Romans were reading this letter that, you know, they see the wrath of God. God poured out at the end of chapter number one, and you, you, there's probably fear put into the hearts of the people reading this letter. So Paul then takes chapter number two, and we know that the chapters, books, and verses were all at, added after the fact, but uh, Paul takes the next part of his letter, and he begins to explain the judgment of God. And uh, I was going to preach this last Sunday night, but we had a business meeting and pastor asked me and I gladly moved it to tonight. And it just was amazing to see how God orchestrated. He preaches this morning on Ananias and Sapphira and integrity. And we saw a judgment fall in their lives. And then tonight we're in Romans chapter two, where Paul outlines the judgment of God. And tonight I want to go into chapter two and start off with an illustration. And if I could for just a moment, just talk to you for a second about youth ministry. Youth ministry is something that is chaotic at best, all right? It is something that you make a plan, you have preparations, and then you're ready to throw all those away and do something different. Um, youth ministry is awesome, it's fun, it's exciting, but it's also heart-wrenching. It's also, um, in all ministries that way, when you surrender, it, it's, it's chaotic at best. And, and one of the main things you do as a youth pastor is you plan activities, you plan fun games, you plan things for the young people to enjoy and come together and see that you can have fun and be a Christian because the world lies to them and tells them the only way to have fun is to sin. So we are all the time coming up with activities and games and Miss Candy and I, we rack our brains trying to come up with a set of rules and guidelines that they can understand and that they can follow. And it doesn't matter what we say the rule is, it doesn't matter what guidelines we put in place, there's always a teenager or two that find loopholes and they find, you said we couldn't run but you never said we couldn't walked very fast or you you said we couldn't <clears throat> you said we couldn't push and shove but you didn't say we couldn't trip somebody things like that so I got to thinking about the judgment of God and and how it applies to the life of every believer and if I took those teenagers and I gathered them all together and I said all right teenagers we are going to have a race today and for the sake of illustration that race is going to be a long race all right and the start line is going to say the gospel and by starting out with the gospel, accepting and crossing that gospel line, there's going to be a finish line out there that says heaven. Because you've accepted the gospel, you are guaranteed a place at the finish line. You are guaranteed a place in heaven. And I gather them all on the starting line, and I get ready, and I get set, and I say go. And I do not tell them if there are any boundaries. I do not tell them if there are any uh, guidelines or places that they cannot go. I don't tell them that there are any rules against pushing or shoving or cheating in any way. I don't tell them any of the regulations, guidelines, any of the things that are going to dictate how this race is to be run. And I just simply say there's the start line, there's the finish line on your mark, get set, go, and they begin to run that race, is it going to be uh, a very fun race to run for some of those teenagers? Is it going to be a fair race for some of those teenagers? Some of them over here are shaking their heads, nope, because he didn't tell me I couldn't do this. He didn't tell me I couldn't do that. He didn't tell me that this was against the rules or that was against the rules. Is everyone going to enjoy running that race? Is anybody watching the race going to look at the chaos that's going to ensue and say, I want to run the race with that group of teenagers? No, they're not because there's going to be ones pushing, shoving, tripping, falling. There's going to be ones cutting corners. There's going to be ones ducking and diving and taking shortcuts and trying to do it the easy way. And we know that if we accept the gospel, that we are set forth on a race. Paul said, let us run the race with patience, <clears throat> uh, the, the race that is set before us. And we know that heaven is guaranteed for all those who accept the gospel. But if we don't understand the guidelines and the rules and the regulations and the way we are going to be judged in our lives, it becomes very, very hard to run the race well. It becomes very, very hard to run the race and not make any mistakes. It becomes very, very hard to run the race and 
enjoy it and be able to invite others to run alongside you. No, this is not going to be very fun for them because none of the participants knew what was expected of them and they didn't know how they would be judged. They didn't know how they would be judged. Many times Christians start their journey with Christ and they run that race to man's expectations or man's judgment instead of God's judgment. A lot of times we start our journey as young Christians and we don't understand what God expects of us fully, but we find a man or we find a religion or we find an ABC123 program that programs us to do things a certain way. And that may be okay for a little while, but if we don't understand what God's judgment is and what God expects of us, a lot of times we mess up and we make mistakes that we may not have never made if we truly understood how God judged you and how God judges me. And Paul deals with that. First thing I want you to notice tonight is God's judgment is personal. God's judgment is personal. Look at verse number one. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. So, first thing I want to understand tonight is that God's judgment over his children, over his believers, just like we talked about this morning, he whom he loveth, he chastises, but whom he loveth, he chastises. It's not your job or our job to chastise another believer. We also know that Peter said judgment must begin at the house of God, but we know that Jesus Jesus said, why are you looking at what's in your brother's eye? First look at what's in your eye. We, we have to be able to reconcile all this. And Paul does something here where he points out the hypocrisy that was going on there at Rome, apparently something that he wanted to address, how that there were people judging other believers on how they were running their race and they were partaking in some of the exact same behaviors. If I had Chase and Chelsea, two of my young ones in here tonight, they are track stars. They are fast as lightning. Kenneth realized he's not in school anymore when Chase left him in the dust in a running contest out back where we were playing football and Chase just ran away from him and left him. Chase and Chelsea are two of our teenagers. They're twins and they're the ones that are always running everywhere they go. You'll be able to easily identify them. If I were to ask them tonight, what happens in a track race at a track meet if they step into another person's lane? They would tell me that the rules state that they would be disqualified. Nothing disqualifies people from the ministry, people from serving God faster than becoming a hypocrite. And coming in alongside them, running in the same race, running along by the judgment of God, knowing what's right, knowing what's wrong, and thinking that they can enter into somebody else's lane where they ought not be and try to critique and criticize and judge someone when they are guilty of some of the exact same things in their lives. And the Bible says, staying in your lane without excuse. This speaks of knowing better and choosing to do it anyways. Okay. When he says, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever there art that judges, that means you see somebody else's sin and you know you've got the same stuff going on in your heart, but you think that you're in a position to where you can judge them based on your opinions and your merits and cross over into their lane for just a moment. He says, <coughs> you're inexcusable for doing something like that. Hypocrisy is the biggest disqualifier of an effective Witness. Many times we wonder why our friends don't come with us to church, why they don't want to have anything to do with the church we go to. Could it be because of the way we speak at work, how we act at work? Um, I have conviction in my own life sometimes. I have employees and sometimes I get a temper and I get really angry how I spelled out exactly what I wanted them to do in an email. Step by step by step, please do this, then do this, then do this. And the next day I get an email from my boss saying that something was not done and it was the very thing that I asked them to do. It was the very thing that I spelled out. And I want to go down to that boat shop and I want to grab them by their little cheeks and put their face in mine and say, and I told you. But I can't do that. Why? Because if I was angry, if I let my temper show, if I let them see that I was just somebody that gets mad and gets riotous and gets angry and gets my temper all riled up, and then I turn around next Sunday and I say, hey, we're having homecoming. Why don't you come be in church with us? After I just lost my cool. Hypocrisy is the biggest disqualifier of an effective witness. Why do we wonder why some of the people that are in our lives don't want to have nothing to do with the God we serve? Could it be that they see us trying to come into their lane when our lane is not in order? Sticking with the truth. Look at verse 2. But we are sure that the judgment of God, that word judgment there, is <coughs> different than the word in verse 1. The verse 1 is judgest, okay? 
That, was, that literally means that you're making a decision, all right? In the judgment in verse 2, it's a different uh, context of the same word. It's a different, uh, you know, statement of the same word. And it seems to me that it is a decision that's already been made, okay? So when you're talking about our judgment, these are decisions we're making. When you're talking about the judgment of God, it's a decision that's already been made because God is from eternity to eternity. So we are sure that the judgment of God is according to the truth, all right, uh, that word there, I'm not going to be pronouncing it, but the word truth there it speaks specifically of a divine truth, all right, and according to the truth against them which commit such things. So what he's saying there is that when you're running this race, when you're looking at the area of God's judgment, not only is it personal in the area where you cannot judge and exercise God's judgment in hypocrisy, but that it has already been settled. God's beliefs, God's feelings, God's stances, God's opinions have already been decided. He is holy. He is righteous. He is king. He has made his decisions. There's nothing we can petition to him to change his mind. There's nothing, there's no letter that we can write to the editor to get him to change the book. There's no letter that we could write to a congressman to get him to change his mind on what he believes about something and that when we're seeing the judgment of God understanding that it's not our opinions or your opinions or like our pastor says the book of second opinions it is the truth it is his word it is his light it is his book that should dictate how we understand the judgment of God I wonder how God would feel if we did this as a church or we did this as a youth group or we did this as a company have you looked in the book have you read what he has already had to say about it have you seen what his scriptures say about it. I wonder how God would feel about doing this this way or doing this this way. Understanding the judgment of God is understanding that it is all in his word. It has all already been decided. It is there for you and it is there for me to see and, and interpret and to apply to our lives. So God's judgment tonight is personal. God's judgment is also permanent. Look at verse three. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and doest the same. We're still talking about that hypocritical man here. That thou shalt escape the judgment of God. I want us to think about that for a second. This is talking about that hypocritical man that thinks that if he critiques others enough, it will somehow elevate his level of righteousness. That if he critiques others enough, if he paints others around him as bad enough Christians are bad enough sinners that it will somehow elevate his own status and make him look better by comparison. The way I do this with the youth group is I have all the boys that are all athletic and they're all, I said, who can jump really high? And they're all raising their hands. I said, who can jump really far? And they all raise their hands. And I get about 10 boys on the baseline of a basketball court right under the, right under the rim. And I say, okay, everybody, today the standard is I want you to jump from one baseline all the way to the other one. And immediately everybody starts laughing. That's an entire basketball court. Nobody can do that. But I look at them and I say, who wants to try? And they're all raise their hand. I'm going to do it. Because they got all their friends watching. All right. They got all their, uh, they got all their, their peers watching. And they want to just see who can jump the farthest. If, if we're going to try, if the standard's over there, we're going to try. And I have them all one at a time. They're jumping. And they're jumping as far as they can. And I say, wherever you land, you stop. So we can see who wins. And, and they all, one after one after one, they all jump. And their, their friends are cheering. Their friends are kind of laughing at them, picking at them when they fall over or tip over. But then at the end of the challenge, I ask the crowd, I say, who won? And they all, you know, like we do, they point to the boy that jumped farther than anybody else. And I say, but hold on a second. The standard was jumping all the way across to the other baseline. It doesn't matter who made it farther than who. Every single one of them lost. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that for the wages, or for that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And a lot of times here in verse 3, what we think we can do is if I can jump farther than they can, if I can wear something just a little bit churchier than he does, or if I can sing just a little bit prettier than she does, if I can do something just a little bit more spiritual and I can critique somebody else, maybe it'll elevate me in the sight of an almighty of God. Paul's saying, do you really think you can escape the judgment? Because the Bible has already told us that in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. All right. In John 3, 18, it says, he that believeth not is condemned already. There's nothing you can do any better than anybody else to change God's mind about your eternity, change God's judgment on your life. It's permanent. We're understanding God's judgment tonight. Knowing the jury is out and hearing the verdict are two totally different things. One day at work, when I was supposed to be hard at work, I had uh, the Tennessee football game on YouTube. All right. 
And I have two monitors and I'm working on one and I got the football game playing. Well, eventually the football game was over, but I was still at work. And it went on to another video and it was all these news videos of people that had been in court cases. And the, the, video, the video was this, it was the person standing and finding out what the verdict was and the, the video was their reaction. And, I, and it was just playing and then I got to watching it and there'd be this person that was convicted of murder or this person that was convicted of fraud or this person. And <clears throat> I'm sitting there like, why, did, why am I even watching this? And then as I started preparing for this message, I was like, oh, that's why I was watching it. The, the way somebody's face was changed. They knew all the evidence in the court case. They knew, whatever, they knew everybody knew what they did. They knew everybody kind of had their own opinions and their own feelings about them. But when that jury came back and said, guilty, this is your sentence. It was like for the first moment in that person's life, whatever the case may be, the, the reality set in that the judgment was permanent, that the judgment had been settled, that their case was closed. They had no chance to change it anymore. They had no chance to uh, do anything about it. The judgment of God is much the same way. It is permanent. It is set in stone for the wages of sin is death. But... The gift of God is eternal life. And that's where Paul moves to verse number four. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Don't you know that you right now are in a space of grace? You are in a place and throughout time and eternity where God has stayed his hand of wrath and stayed his hand of execution. The gavel has not dropped on humankind yet. We are literally living in the goodness of God and right now we have access to eternal life. Understanding God's judgment is permanent is understanding that right now in the dispensation which you live in and I live in, we have the opportunity to change the outcome of somebody else's eternity by sharing with them the gospel. And Paul writes here to this, this, this group of believers and says, do you realize that right now you are living in the goodness of God? They're in Rome. They're no doubt under severe persecution. They're no doubt starving to death because they can't go out in public and buy things and do things anymore. They're no doubt uh, fearing for their very lives. And Paul writes to them and says, you're right now in your moment. You are in the goodness of God. And no matter how bad your situation is right now, no matter how bad my situation is right now, we are living in the dispensation of grace. We are living in the church age where right now there are opportunities for you and for me to do things for the kingdom that will last eternity. There's opportunities for people to get saved right now. Right now you and I are living in the goodness of God. And we know that that is for now. And that is for a short time. But one time that, that trumpet's going to blow. And we're going to go home to glory. And then God's hand of judgment will fall. And God's hand of wrath will fall. But just like, <clears throat> excuse me, just like God has given us a space of grace now, are we wasting it or are we using it? There's a song we sing is in the youth group that your goodness is running after me. Your goodness is running after me. Some of you in here tonight, you may not have been in church in a long time. His goodness is running after you. Some of you in here tonight, you may just be uh, kind of up in the air on this God thing, up in the air on this, is he really, could he really love me that much? Could he really save me? His goodness is running after you. As a matter of fact, the only reason that he hasn't come back yet to take his church is because there's still believers that are people out there that have not yet chose to say yes. And he's waiting on you. He's waiting on that last believer to say yes to the gospel, to say yes to Jesus. And when that last believer says yes to Jesus and that completes his bride... His goodness is over, and that period of time is done. But could it be you tonight that you're living in the goodness of God and you don't even realize it because like the text says, you're so busy comparing yourself to everybody else. And you're so busy self-righteousing yourself that you're missing it. Don't you know that the forbearance of God, in verse five, but after the hardness and impotent heart treasures up to thyself wrath, against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteousness and judgment of God. God's judgment's permanent. Thirdly, God's judgment is patient. Look at verse six. Who will render every man according to his deeds to him who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, looking to eternity. 
Looking to eternity is what that verse is talking about. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. I've heard our pastor say it, living with an eternal perspective on things. Living in a way that says God's judgment is on my life. God's ju- he is watching me. He is my father. I'm living for him and I'm going to spend eternity with him. I want to live in such a way that does not just please him now. Of course, that's amazing and that's awesome. That's what we should strive to do. But we shouldn't be simply living to please God for now. We should be simply living to please God for eternity. To take as many people to heaven with us as we possibly can. To have a good relationship with our father for eternity. I've said it to the team teenagers like this. Have you ever met somebody for the first time and had that awkward experience of just trying to get to know them? Okay. There's going to be folks in heaven that they met Jesus in their life somewhere. They accepted him. They got saved, but they're only going to really start getting to know him when they get to heaven because they just got in. They just got in. How much greater would it be for you to recognize him and him to recognize you and you to already be so close because of how much of an eternal perspective you had while you were here. And you walk with them here and you talk with them here and you praised them in the bad times here and you praised them in the good times here. You had an eternal perspective when you got stuck at that red light and you didn't get all frustrated and furious and mad and cussed out the guy in front of you. You, you, you had an eternal perspective when the little drive through worker is the one one that showed up to work that day and she's the only one that cared enough to show up to work but she got your order wrong and you came back and you pointed out the mayonnaise and pickles on your sandwich and you yelled and you hollered. That's not an eternal perspective. That that mayonnaise and pickles is going to burn up in eternity. But it's our job to make sure that little girl don't burn up in eternity. Living with eternal perspective. God's judgment is patient. He's literally holding it back to give you time and me time to day by day, day by day, die daily and say, I'm going to live with an eternal perspective. Verse 8. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Understanding God's judgment is also understand that, that just like blessing follows obedience, tribulation follows disobedience. A lot of times, look here, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth and obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. What happens to them? What's their life full of? Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man and doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Regardless of your background, you've got that indignation, you've got that wrath, you've got that anger and that bitterness in your heart. God's gave you a promise. You're going to have, what are you going to have? Tribulation and anguish. You see that believer that knows Christ, but they just hold that anger. They hold that bitterness and they hold that indignation. And a lot of them tell me, oh, it's righteous indignation. They were wrong. I was right. This is not sin. This is righteous indignation. I read after a preacher that said this, righteous indignation can only be counted as righteous if it's held against sin. Anything else is just plain old anger. A lot of times we say we're righteous in our indignation, but if the object of that indignation is not sin, it's probably just anger. It's probably just pride. And it's probably just thinking that we get to hurry along God's judgment rather than allowing patience and His judgment to unfold. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. A lot of times we want to get people back for what God's already got them back for. Ten years down the road and you don't even know what God's going to do. How many of you have ever prayed, God, get them? Guilty. Guilty. Lord, get them. You know what his response is? I already got them. They're going to learn their lessons just like you're going to learn your lessons. You don't worry about them. I'll worry about them, the Lord says. Fourthly, God's judgment is pure. Look at verse 11. <clears throat> For there is no respect of persons with God. Let me read that again for the religious crowd. For there is no respect of persons with God. Here's a verse that makes religious folks and legalist folks real nervous. Because who wrote that? Paul, right? 
one of the greatest preachers I've ever lived, writes a verse that says there's no respect of persons with God. And what he's literally saying here is there's no favoritism with God. And in context, what he's saying is he's talking to a group of Gentiles that have no religious background. And he's talking to a group of Jews that have a lot of religious background. And they're fussing and fighting because the Jews are telling the Gentiles how to live right. And the Gentiles are saying, I don't need the law to know what's right and what's wrong. I have a moral sense and we're all Christians now and we've got to figure this out. And he sorts it all out by saying, hey, there is no respect of persons with God. There is no favoritism with God. And God shows no favoritism to the Jew, his chosen people, over the Gentile. In Christ, they are the same. In Christ, they are the same. In Christ, they are his children. They are reconciled back to God the Father through the blood of Jesus Christ. And when he says it, in verse number uh, 12, for as many have sinned without the law, shall also perish without the law. He's saying if you sin believing in the commandments and the laws of Moses and the 613 Jewish laws, if you didn't follow them then, you're going to die with them then. And if you didn't know what the laws were, but you were still a sinner, you're going to die without the law. And he goes through and he sorts out the weeds in verses 12 through 16 for the sake of time. We won't go there. But Paul now explains that no matter what your background, whether you have a head knowledge or whether you have a knowledge of the law or whether you have a good conscience and you're trying to be a good moral person, it's not going to matter. There's nothing you can do to earn favoritism with God. There's nothing you can do to earn stature with God. God does not care about your education, although education is important. God does not care about your job title even though you have to work for a living. God does not care about this or that. He does not care how much money you have. He does not care how much money you don't have. He does not care whether you have a wrecked home life or you have a perfect home life. God died for, Jesus died for everybody. Jesus accepts everybody and God's judgment will fall on everybody regardless of where you fit in the man spectrum. There is no respect of persons with this go with God. In verse 16, he sums it up. And the day when God shall judge the secrets of men. I love that. I love that. Nothing escapes the judgment of God. In the day that God shall judge the secrets of men. Church may not know about it. Your wife may not know about it. Your husband may not know about it. Your family may not know about it. Your parents may not know about it. But one day when God shall judge the secrets of men. What's he going to judge them by? By Jesus Christ. According to my gospel. The only thing that's going to matter is what you said to Jesus. Did you say yes? Or did you say no? And if you said yes tonight, as Miss Joy's coming, do you understand that we can't stand on a pedestal and judge in hypocrisy? Jesus did say in Matthew, first go get your own eyes clear, then go back to your brother to help him with his problem. Peter did say, judgment begins at the house of God. There is a place for a righteous man to help and maybe rebuke or maybe help along an unrighteous man. But there is no place for a hypocrite in the judgment of God. There is no place for favoritism in the judgment of God. There is no place for anger in the judgment of God. I hope tonight as we've looked through these verses and you understand God's judgment, I hope it helps you like it helped me to know the boundaries of the race we're running, to know what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. And as Paul summed it up, and I'm done, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2, this has been a verse Brother Frank reads to me all the time. God's judgment isn't my judgment. It's so frustrating how he doesn't do things the way I would do them. It's so frustrating how he doesn't hurry up or he doesn't believe how I believe or he doesn't think the way I think. Paul said in, uh, about this race we're in, 12 two of the book of Hebrews, looking unto Jesus. We believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. We don't know for sure, but he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You know how you run the race in God's judgment? Keep your eyes on him. If you keep your eyes on him, you're going to end up at the finish line. And if your eyes on him, you're going to be like him, and you're not going to break any rules along the race line. If I told those same teenagers to bring it back home, you don't know where the finish line is, and you don't know any of the rules, but as you run this race, be like Jesus and run towards him. They'd make it, and they'd have a good time doing it. And they may just, may just bring others along with them and spend heaven forever. Let's stand and sing. A verse of invitation as I pray. Father, thank you.
for the book of Romans. Thank you for smoting my heart and speaking to my heart about your judgment. God, as we sing, if there's one in here tonight that has thought themselves more highly than they should, God, if there's one in here tonight that, God, you've laid somebody on their heart that they need to go to and tell about Jesus before it's everlasting too late, while we still have this space of grace, God, I pray that you help them to pray for them tonight. Jesus, I ask that you move in this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing.